Okay, guys, um, welcome to obviously the coolest topic at uh, EA Global Cambridge, which is philosophy of AI. Um, one of my favorites work by Nora is adding blueprints to Yudkowsky's Maps and Territory, but she's an associate researcher at the uh, Simon Institute for AI Research um, and does an MPhil at uh, Northeastern and um, is just all around really, really awesome researcher in different intelligences in social and artificial systems. Um, so Nora, what's, what's yours? Cool. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about alignment across natural and artificial systems. I hope the title will make more sense once I've said some more words. Um, very quickly about myself, so I'm currently doing a degree in philosophy and AI at Northeastern, and I'm involved with mostly two projects. One is the Principle of Intelligent uh, Behavior in Biological and Social Systems project, PIPS. So this is mostly a, like, field building related project trying to facilitate more of the sort of research that I'm gonna to talk to you about. We like, like fellowship programs and like some other things. Um, and then the alignment of complex systems research group is like a research group doing, doing research at the intersection of AI alignment informed by things like, by like complex systems and related topic, uh, related domains of study. Um, and I, yeah. So like my research interests roughly sort of involve philosophy of AI, philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, political philosophy and meta-ethics, um, and AI alignment, or like how those things apply to alignment. So quite broad, um, but yeah, I hope you'll see, see sort of more uh, context on this. And then this slide started, looked sort of sad, so I'm gonna, it's like adding a picture. This is me in the mountains. <laughs> okay, cool, quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about. So. I'm gonna start out trying to give a very short sort of what is AI alignment about uh, introduction. Um, I am emphasizing very short because there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, in fact, like my personal take is that we do not as a research community have like a good or like the right grasp of what we even mean by alignment. That doesn't mean we can't you know, make any progress on it or uh, that it's not worth thinking about it. Um, but it is a sort of thorny, messy sort of question. I'm hoping to introduce some, some things about it that might um, help orient, but um, also flagging this is, I think, to some extent, uh, an open question. Um, in the second part, uh, I'm gonna talk about what I call the problem of epistemic access for alignment research. So this is sort of a philosophy of science angle on how do we even, in principle, uh, make progress on this question. Um, and then, finally, I dive into one specific uh, strategy for maybe making progress on alignment. This is one among others. Uh, there's other strategies that we should also pursue, um, but this is the one I like, want to talk about uh, more in this talk. And then there's some closing and time for questions. Cool. Uh, so what is alignment? Very briefly. Um, Maybe as a quick framing of this, and I did steal this, this framing from a friend, Jan Browner, who I think, like, I liked his framing, so I'm gonna start out with this. So like, in traditional programming, one thing that we, the thing that we do is that we like, give a system an input and we have like an algorithm, a program, and then the system does some computation and we get the result. Like, that's sort of traditional programming. How is this different from machine learning, which is sort of the main way we currently think of AI or artificial intelligence. Uh, what we do there is that we give a system both the input and examples of like the desirable results and what it outputs or what it learns is a program to do the same mapping um, in new situations. So we're not just getting sort of the results, um, but we're getting like programs that can like supposedly do this thing, this general thing in new situations. Um, one way of framing, I think, uh, what, how to understand AI, AI, specific AI applications is that there are instances of a general class of systems which, very broadly speaking, do something like pursuing a goal or objective by means of increasingly sophisticated behavior. Uh, so this is sort of like describing the program sort of thing we saw coming out here. Um, this is like the behavior part, and increasingly sophisticated here means increasingly intelligent, increasingly complex, increasingly sort of surprising in the sort of thing it can achieve um, in, in the real world. 
Uh, now, one caveat I want to give here is that I'm introducing the notion of goals and objectives. Uh, this is a bit of a tricky topic because like, there's like <laughs> a lot of discussion around like, what are goals? Are they real? Like, do, do these sort of train systems, these LM systems, do they have goals in like, what sense? What I want to flag here just for now, although there's much more to be said about this, is that goal-directed behavior can emerge in many different ways. Like it could emerge as a sort of deliberately or explicitly programmed feature. Like we're like programming a system to do a certain, like to pursue a certain thing, uh, which is maybe more mapping onto the, the traditional programming uh, notion. But there's also a way in which goal-directed behavior can emerge merely from training in the ML uh, context. Um, and uh, one problem that we'll see in a bit is that we might not even always understand what goal-directed behavior will emerge from a specific training set. Um, grounding this, oh, wrong direction. Oh yeah, grounding this a bit in uh, like what you probably have been seeing a lot uh, all over the internet in recent days and weeks and months and years. Um, what can we do today? We can do a lot with language, GPT-3, uh, GPT-4. Um, we can do a lot with images, search, recommend the system, self-driving cars, um, probably increasingly manufacturing, personalized medicine, science, robotics. Like I think these are all systems, like all things you will have encountered that like AI is like helping us to do these things at much faster and like bigger scales. Um, and then also just to illustrate, like. I mentioned language above, but like really language sort of like decomposes into many, many things like uh, an, a GPT-4 type system or like a, a system that is based on something like GPT-4 can become a pretty general, like generally useful personal assistance or like writing assistant. It can help us in education. It can like do planning for us. Um, it can like write lawsuits for you, et cetera. Like there's, there's many applications that we're sort of like unlocking with this current AI progress thing. Um, that will probably have like important effects on the world. So like moving a bit into the risk part now, from a high level, uh, I think we can sort of a priori say things like, hmm, we get more and more powerful like behavior in the way I've described it earlier. Well, that's gonna, th that's gonna have like a priori probably pretty big effects on the world, even if we don't know what exactly, uh, maybe one analogy here that is relevant is like, what I've, like, what I've been showing you earlier is sort of pointing in the direction of automating basically all of cognitive labor. The last time we automated labor, <laughs> that had like a pretty big effect. Like that's what happened when we automated labor last time. What if, what if we automate all cognitive labor? It's just gonna be massive. So that, that's sort of like one quite like, far, like quite removed, quite high level take on like, it's gonna be big. I'm not quite sure how, but it's gonna be big. Um, and then obviously we already see this in like context of like information, sense making, and also sort of collective moral political deliberation, the effects on us living together as humans is like uh, starting to be very salient. There is a few more specific arguments that uh, are often brought up in the context of AI risk and alignment that are also worth uh, noting or understanding. So I was earlier talking about goal-directed behavior already. The, the difficulty with goal-directed behavior is basically twofold. There's one question which is like, well, if they're gonna pursue goals, these AI systems, what goals do we want them to pursue? And that, that's, a, that's a big and complicated question, like Jason Gabriel calls this the like, normative question, like what are individual human values, what are our collective values, what should we tell those systems to do? That's one part of the problem. And the other part is, we actually, at this point in time, don't even, even if we knew what, what goals to give these systems, we don't know how to do this. Like, we don't know how to give a, an AI system a goal, or any goal, in such a way that it ends up pursuing this goal, A, in the way we attend to, and B, that it continues to pursue this goal sort of over time and reliably. These two ideas uh, are often referred to as just sort of like, maybe signposting here in, term, in case you want to learn more, they're often referred to as, on one hand, goal misspecification or like value misspecification or specification. Um, so there's a difficulty of even specifying what, what the system should do. 
uh, like basically there's sort of like three different things, three different types of goals that are happening in AI systems. Like one is like, well, there's our goal. That's like the goal we sort of want to give it. Then uh, there is the, uh, the training, like the training setup, how the training is set up, like how we give the system reward. Um, and then finally there's like, the trained system as it's going to be like deployed in the world, what system, what goal is that actually pursuing? And that these, the training goal and the, the system's goal in the end are not necessarily the same thing. So this makes value specification very hard. And then the second part here is often referred to as like misgeneralization, both uh, goal as well as capability misgeneralization that like, for example, in the case of what, they, what is called distributional shift. So like you train a, an AI on like a specific data set, then you deploy it into the world where it's gonna, um, you know, uh, run into new type of data that it hasn't, new type of situation that it hasn't encountered before. Will it do the thing we wanted it to do? Uh, there's sort of limit, li limited amounts of uh, guarantees for that and that can be a problem. Cool, so that's the, my sort of, my very quick introduction of here is roughly problems we are facing. Here is roughly some things you would have to get right for like AI alignment to go right. I do already now, just gonna signpost a caveat. I like will later say a bit more why I think this is actually not quite enough yet. Um, but we'll, we'll see that later on. And uh, I do think this is like an important basis to like grok about uh, AI risk and AI alignment. Cool, hoping this made somewhat sense. Uh, and moving on to the next part, uh, which is the problem of epistemic access. So what do I mean by this? Basically, I just outlined to you a problem. And then there's this question of like, well, how do we make progress on this problem? And basically what I'm claim, trying to claim in this part here is that like, this is actually really hard. And there's like some systematic difficulties to making progress that are like worth understanding. Uh, Brief, in brief, this, what the, one of the problems here is that, uh, one of epistemic access, what do I mean by epistemic access? Um, I basically mean something like, okay, sorry, that's not, oh, there we go. Um, the way that science and engineering works, typically, like really what is the like, the oil in this machinery or what's the like fuel in the machinery of science and engineering as we know it and as it has brought us a lot of benefits so far is a large amount of empiricism. It's doing experiments and in engineering specifically it's basically doing trial and error. Experiments require, and both experiments and trial and error sort of work, requires you to be able to like work with the system, like look at the system, and like interact with the thing you're interested in directly. Um, and then you can like, you know, run experiments on it. Uh, that's, that's the sort of the success story of science and engineering so far. In the case of AI, however, and specifically alignment of like future and ever more powerful systems, those systems don't exist right now. So we can't do experimentation on exactly those systems. Um, and like trial and error is it's a bad idea for other reasons. Um, so yeah, there's like a basic problem here of like, how do we even like, there's a system I want to study, but the system doesn't exist yet. How, how do I still make progress on this systematically? Some caveats here about like, does it exist yet or not? Like, we do in fact have a GPT-4 uh, and I can do experimentation on that. And that is like, that is important and valuable and relevant. And there is a question of like, well, when is the system we're most worried about? When does it exist? Some people will argue it exists already. I think GPT-4 is definitely a system we should be very concerned with. But I still think something about the claim I'm trying to make here uh, holds um, in an important way. Um, so we can't do science and engineering in quite the way as we, as we do generally. I don't want to overstate this claim because like, there is other domains in science that also really have challenges uh, to epistemic access. Um, that either it's very costly or it's like the system you want to study is very far away. So it's not like usually we can just very easily access uh, uh, empirical data, uh, but I think it's a very important problem here. And in view of this problem, I sort of suggest a one pot possible view on like the current AI alignment research landscape. Uh, this is not the only meaningful view or meaningful sort of like categorization you can take, but I think it's like a useful one to orient with. 
Um, and basically, I, I'm describing this as like different epistemic strategies uh, based on different assumptions um, f as to how we're going to make progress despite the problem of epistemic access. Um, the three strategies uh, that I'm, I'm thinking of here very quickly are one, I'm going to call it tinkering. This is basically the idea that future AI or like whatever the sort of AI we're like most worried about will look a bit like meaningfully like current ML systems, meaning that uh, if we uh, study current ML systems, if we study how they fail, if you study how we can make them safer, this sort of, inform this sort of insight will generalize to the sort of systems we are uh, interested in. So that's one assumption, that's sort of the assumption underlying all of technical ML safety work. Uh, I think this is like a valid assumption to be taken um, and like one reason why this work is valuable. There's another um, type of research direction uh, if some of you are sort of familiar with like terms like agent foundations or like the more sort of older work uh, or like sort of old school work of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute that's most centrally mapping on to this type of research. The idea here is that you say future AI will look a bit like sort of idealized rational agents. So what you do here is that you idealize systems by using lots of advanced math and, and advanced logic and sort of formal epistemology. And then you sort of ask, well, if the system is, is behaving like an idealized rational agent, what would it mean for the system to be safe? What would it mean for this system to not uh, do bad things? Um, and then try to generalize those insights. Um, why might this assumption be valid? Because we are expecting for these AI systems to become more and more powerful and to at least approximate something like an idealized rational agent. So that's the second strategy. And then the third, third strategy uh, takes yet a different assumption and says future AI systems will be governed by at least some of the same principles as uh, that govern currently existing intelligent systems or intelligent, yeah. Um, so here the assumption is that there's something about intelligent behavior, whether it occurs in silicon or in neurons or among people or whatever, um, that like is governed by similar, the same, partially the same principles, such that if we understand more about these principles in intelligent behavior in general, this will enable us to generalize some of these insights to AI systems, artificial systems. Um, and the upside here is that, well, there is lots of intelligent behavior that is like currently existing that we have epistemic access to, uh, like brains, like collective human behavior, uh, like markets, et cetera, um, that we can study. So that this was sort of yet another way of overcoming this epistemic access problem. Um, yeah, this is not what it's supposed to look like, but the, the red thing is supposed to say all these, the red mark bits, are things that we do have at least better epistemic access to, so they like, can help us overcoming this epistemic access problem. Cool, uh, so brief recap, I did say something about AI alignment, what it even is about. Uh, I did say something about how do we make progress on this uh, and talked about the problem of epistemic access. The last bit um, that I wanna talk about is zooming in a bit more on one specific strategy here, namely the last one I mentioned, intelligence in the wild, sort of as shorthand for this. Um, cool, so that's what's coming up next. Uh, I wanna introduce the sort of thinking around how do we draw insight from studying intelligent behavior in natural systems uh, first. Uh, this is a picture that's mean, meant to uh, represent like the space of, intelli of all of intelligent systems. Like this is not a space that actually exists. This is like an abstract space, meaning to represent all types of intelligent behavior or intelligent systems that we can see. And once we sort of imagine this space, interesting questions come up like, how do these, how do these like, spaces relate to each other? Are they like, close to each other? Are they governed by the same principles? Are they governed by different principles? Um, how do we like, move to these systems in a, in a sense of like, becoming able to create systems that maybe don't yet exist. So that's just sort of a like, philosophical abstract tool to kind of think about uh, all of this, uh, this question. Also just flagging, this is like drawing in part of, uh, on a forthcoming post by uh, some of my collaborators at ACS and I, um, and uh, including that drawing. <laughs> so what is it that we, oh, 
what is it that we want? So like, the thing we want in the end is to have accurate maps of the part of this space um, that, uh, that sort of represents the future AGI or the future powerful AI systems that we're worried about. We want to get good maps, good understanding, good theories about what these, this, this bit of the space will look like. Um, now, one way we could go about this is to try to get at bits of theory, maps, models um, that help us understand different parts of the space, uh, parts that we currently have access to. And then one thing that is worth noting here is that different maps, different theories uh, that we can have about this space, uh, m they come with different features. Uh, for example, we might have some theories that are very general in the sense of like they aim to explain a large part of this overall space. Um, another feature that could have is that they're like very precise, um, as in when I know this theory, I really understand a lot about how animals work. Like I can predict a lot, I have like a mechanistic understanding of really how, how do animals or whatever the system is work. And most of the time, these, these two features trade off against each other. Um, and these are both features that we basically want because we need generality because uh, we want the theory to also cover the system we're interested in. But we also want precision because otherwise, like, we might not be able, like, it's not very useful and we might not actually be able to do anything with that, the theory we've come up with. Um, this is just very general thing that comes up in philosophy of science a lot or in, in science making in general. Uh, like, just some examples of theories that are, like, relatively general or, like, aiming to be general while still meaningfully mechanistic or precise or useful. Um, like statistical mechanics and physics, like in some sense covers a lot of ground. Information theory is trying to cover a lot of ground. Active inference, which is a theory, like which is a, a sort of kindly pretty hip theory in um, trying to explain what is cognition in general, like in very general terms, is aiming to cover a lot of grounds. Like there's some people who would say this explains both a lot about how like collective behavioral self-organization works and how like specifically the mind works. So like trying to be very general. Um, and then there's this like interesting thing here that's called the selection theorems that is like, I think my metaphor is actually breaking a bit down in the context of the idea of selection theorems. Selection theorems aim to say something like a certain system um, in a certain environment will converge towards having such and such properties. What this ends up meaning is that like a selection theorem would in fact kind of cover a lot of, of the space um, because it would say all of these systems will end up showing these features because they're like uh, convergingly selected for. Um, so this, this could be a type of theory that like could come with a lot of generality if we, if we can actually find correct, accurate selection theorems. Um, then, one more high-level thing I want to say here uh, is the idea of proxies. This is a notion introduced by um, Kulvait van Merwijk and um, Bajdar in, the, in a work they've done on AGI epistemics. Basically, in this work, they've sort of asked, how do, we, how do we reason about AGI? Again, given it doesn't exist yet, how do we even make sense of like, what the system will look like? Um, and one, one framing they adopted there is that they also sort of looked at how different people disagreed uh, about what AGI will look like or what we should be worried about, etc. And what thing they found is that people tend to rely on different proxies to reason about the system, where proxies here is something like reference frame or something. Like, for example, um, a lot of people will say something like, or will often implicitly assume something like, well, future AGI probably will be a bit like just a very, very, very smart human. Um, or you could say, uh, future AGI will be like a very powerful rational agent. Importantly, I think there's a, I think there's a very important distinction between those two where the human uh, comes with like lots of use of heuristics, use of biases. So like there's a difference in saying it's going to be a very powerful human, but having similar sort of like cognitive uh, heuristics that it's making use of versus saying it's a rational agent. You could also say it's just going to look like current ML, but stronger sort of like just statistics on steroids or something. You could also say, oh, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> um, 
you could also say it's just what, how we used to think about it. It's just like in sort of quite economic terms, it's just going to automate all of this. Like this is the way we should think about future AGI. Um, we could think about it as like drawing a very close analogy to evolution, drawing a close analogy to markets. But like the idea here is like markets are kind of intelligent in some way, where they're like they're really good at like allocating resources um, uh, for like growth and innovation, and like this is kind of should be really surprising because like this is based on like lots of local information that isn't being centralized, and like still this like kind of works really well. So like something interesting is going on there. Like maybe AGI is going to kind of look like that. Um, cultural evolution on steroids, um, just collective intelligence. So this is just like a bunch of examples. And what I'm trying to say is like, when you try to think about what's AGI, what AGI is gonna be like, you don't know directly. So you're gonna often use some sort of reference class to be like, that sort of informs you priors as to what is plausible, uh, what are plausible claims you could make about AGI. Um, this, you can like use this frame to like un make sense of some agreement you might hear in, in, in conversations, like different researchers might, might say, um, this and this is gonna happen, and another one says, no, 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 I disagree, this and this is gonna happen. One way of trying to make sense of this is being like, are they like using different reference system to try to reason about this? Um, another thing inside or like up upshot from this is that none of these proxies is equivalent to AGI. Like none of these is the correct proxy. Um, and instead, we should probably like use a bunch of them, or like at least sort of like triangulate between a bunch of them. Um, so I think I'm like generally a bit less interested in being like let's reason about which one is the best one, and a bit more being like cool, like what different predictions come up. I do think there is things to be said about well, this one seems more plausible than the other, but um, cool. And now I'm gonna mostly finish up just giving a bunch of examples of like what this research might look like concretely. Um, this is kind of tricky because like we're sort of like talking about the entire space of intelligent systems, which is a massive space. So really the, the, the range of questions here is really big. And then I still wanted to provide some sort of like a slightly more concrete things. Um, but yeah, they're like sort of, there's a definitely bias in how I'm sampling them. There shouldn't be sort of, uh, you shouldn't interpret that as too restrictive of like the sorts of question one could be asking. Um, and I'm going through them pretty quickly. You might be able to access the slides later on if you want to read more, but just some examples. Um, we could ask, how does motivation or intrinsic motivation work in brains, like in animal brains, in human brains, like minds more generally? There's things to be understood about how does motivation come about evolutionary? How does it function? What's the function once it is developed in the brain? Stuff like that that might be interesting to understand or shape motivations or drives in AI systems. Um, we might sort of ask, given our best theories of cognition, like what do they say about beliefs, values, and alignment, like the relationship beliefs and values? I mentioned active inference earlier. I think active inference has an interesting pl possible implication that values and beliefs are kind of the same sort of thing, which is very different than how we have been thinking about behavior or rational agency generally, where like beliefs and values were sort of these two separate parts that together made agentic behavior active inference says they're the same sort of thing. Like, cool, okay, but like, if that was true, what, what does that mean for alignment? Um, we could ask about like male malevolent or like conflict prone traits, like how do they arise in, in like throughout the evolutionary history, for, throughout the developmental history? So these are some things related to like minds. Um, here's a set of other examples. So there's something about like instrumental sub goals is like a topic that's pretty interesting to a lot of AI alignment work because like, uh, the, yeah, uh, those might like end up shaping the behavior of the future systems a lot through training. So like we could ask throughout the evolutionary tree, like have there been instrumental sub goals that just like tended to emerge very reliably, implying they might be highly convergent. We could understand things about why they're convergent that might help us uh, in alignment research. Um, we might ask, what governs the relationship between agents at different levels of abstraction. So like, I'm an, I'm an agent in some sense. Also like, I'm embedded in maybe a family structure and I'm embedded in a, like a political structure of like a state or something. And there's like relationships between that, these level of hierarchies that we like overall have actually pretty poor formal means to like properly understand. 
um, especially compared to like relationships at the same level of abstraction where we have like game theory and uh, decision theory trying to, um, economics trying to tell us a lot about the, the strategic implications of interacting. What does that mean at the hierarchical level or what does that look like at the hierarchical level might be pretty relevant uh, for various um, alignment questions as well. And then maybe a third sort of area, um, which is more social systems, like we might ask, um, how does the legal tradition deal with the goal value must specification problem? Like, in some sense, we have, as a society, been trying to specify things we care about or things we like don't want to, to see in a society, et cetera, via the law. But the law sort of faces at least a very similar problem of like, you can't specify Every, every possible situation of what you care about. Um, and, and then yet, yeah, like, the legal system has been like, decently, good, decently successful at like, governing our like, collective behavior and like, uh, avoiding you know, particularly bad outcomes. Um, are there interesting analogies here to draw from, or like, insights to draw from for alignment? Um, or like, what if we imagine we're gonna end up with as, at least for a period of time, possibly, a society that comprises humans, AIs, and human AI teams. Like, can we understand anything about like, what sort of dynamics will emerge here? Does this have strategic implication? Seems very hard to make general claims about, but also like, has been tried very little, um, so seems interesting. Um, as I said, there's like, a very big space of questions one could ask. I'm just gonna offer this brief, like, this is sort of uh, the attempt of like uh, a collaborator, TJ and I, when we were thinking about this a bunch, mostly a year ago, we like came up with roughly this clustering that helped us orient a little bit. Um, and I'm just gonna provide this quickly to help you maybe navigate the space a little bit better. So there's a bunch of things uh, to be understood about minds and cognition in general. Like this was mostly just the first slide uh, of the, the examples I was mentioning. There's things about like, autonomous behavior, like goals, information, optimization, the relationship between all of that, emergent uh, behavior, uh, a whole sort of like uh, can of worms. There's a lot of conversation always about like agentic behavior in AI systems. What do we even mean by agen agency? Very, very thorny, but like progress to be made on. Um, there's things related to like evolution and like selection selection theorem stuff which traits are emergent can we learn from like evolutionary history ecology and stuff like that about this and then these two are sort of more on the collective and social levels like one is uh, society there's a sense in which society runs on these processes um, that has been like have been actually responsible I'd claim for like a lot of the flourishing and well-being we have seen which are processes that uh, govern sort of knowledge production um, and also processes that govern uh, moral deliberation or like questions around how do we live together. Um, uh, and these, like if we sort of say like, are there these processes that kindly are helpful in society, you can ask a bunch of questions around, A, how is AI gonna disrupt these? How could AI augment them and improve them? But also like, how do they actually work and can we potentially replicate or get inspiration from how those, those, system, those processes have been working quite reliably, quite successfully for us uh, and like get inspiration from that for alignment. And then socioeconomic uh, like interactions between agents, uh, interactions with the economy uh, or like economic structures, uh, governance structures that like might help um, governing outcomes well. So I'm gonna I think I should mostly skip this. Um, there is, okay, I'm just gonna make this note um, because I have signed on this earlier. Um, when I introduced alignment or like AI risk and AI alignment earlier, I framed it a lot around goals, like goal-directed behavior and like not knowing what goals to specify and how to specify them. I think this is a really important part of the alignment problem, but I also think there's sort of like, uh, we at least have to be careful uh, in how we talk about this. One way of saying this is that goals might not be the right frame to use in the first place. Um, for example, often talk about goals implies, often implicitly implies that there are some sort of well-specified and fixed, um, like already fixed targets that we can reliably aim at. And once we figured out how to aim at them, we're like, we're all good. And it also implies uh, sometimes something like, 
safety or like alignment being intrinsic properties of a system. Like we can design and train a system, and then if I knew enough, I could like say now whether the system is safe or aligned. Like it either has this property or not. Um, that sometimes comes sort of with this goal, goal directed frame. And I think both of these assumptions are to be criticized or at least to be questioned. In particular, um, I think we should take seriously that like the way humans actually value, like do valuing and like do practical reasoning um, does not at all look like the sort of system who would have fixed um, values or like latent values in a sense of like already worked, having worked out everything that I like will ever care about nor necessarily being particularly coherent. Like all of these assumptions just like don't seem to apply at all to humans and also not to human collectives. So like, aim, like aiming at this like one fixed latent thing seems plausibly to just like not be the correct like theory of like what the nature of value or the structure of value even is. Um, and like maybe in view of that, we should like rethink how to even talk about alignment. And then secondly, um, the, with this like idea that like safety or alignment is an intrinsic property of a system, I think this is also to be challenged in that the same system will have very different effects given the environment that it's gonna be deployed in. So I think alignment is actually better understood as a relational property, um, meaning that you can't abstract away from the environment you're gonna deploy the system in. Um, that makes the question yet more complex and, and messy, but I think it is also just like a very relevant and like real consideration we have to be tracking. Cool, that's me. Um, very briefly for closing, uh, I like, said something about alignment. I said something about the problem of epistemic access. I did sort of make a suggestion here around epistemic pluralism. Like we need many maps to, be, to reason about uh, this question because we don't have access to the system directly. And many maps here seems good because we can like triangulate between them and like have them interengage with each other or at least not, not be uh, relying on only one which might turn out to be wrong. And then lastly, if you have expertise or interest in one of these domains, um, you can, I like encourage you to like think a bunch about how like maybe your domain of expertise applies to questions in alignment, maybe write about them and like share your thoughts. I do encourage everyone to like sort of before, like as they do this to like actually try to grapple with the alignment problem quite deeply. Um, I think this is like really important to like get a taste for like which bits of your expertise actually apply or like where's like the most interesting questions to be asking. Um, and also like I'm very happy like feel free to reach out or um, PIPS is like trying to like sort of facilitate such work with fellowships. Um, the, these fellowships run in summer so like mostly this will be relevant for like next summer but even if you're more generally just like interested in working on these types of questions, I'm very happy to talk. Cool, that's it. Thank you very, very much, uh, Nora. So questions are gonna be done through the swap card on the agenda events of alignment in natural intelligence avenues of research. So if you wanna take a minute to find that in the events section, um, and I am going to wait, uh, See, wait on you to those come through. Um, in in the meantime, in in the meantime, can I ask you about um, something you didn't quite mention, but something in your work I have quite liked, which is relation of blueprints to uh, say maps and territory, and how that might fit in this larger sort of um, pluralistic picture. Yeah. Yes, happily. I'm just gonna find a slide that will help me talk about this. Um, there we go. Okay, I just want to be able to refer to this uh, idea of the like space of systems. So, okay, it keeps moving. Um, okay, first, the idea of blueprints. Uh, so, uh, many of you might be familiar with the, the metaphor of like the territory and the map, or the territory isn't a map. Very briefly, the idea is that there's something like reality, like how things actually are, and like this is what we're gonna refer to as the territory. And then there's sort of like, usually us humans, like trying to understand how things actually are or make sense of how things actually are. And we like, in this met metaphor, we do this by creating maps that like help us navigate the territory. And one upshot of this metaphor, or like one thing this metaphor like helps to make clear is that your map isn't equivalent to the territory. Like there will always be differences between the map and the territory. 
um, and then they might just be in terms of like precision, like you haven't worked at all the details of the territory, but you have like good general theories or something, or you might just also have like mistakes uh, in your in your map. Um, but maps are sort of they only become useful when they're like less detailed than the territory, because the thing is you're trying to make sense of the territory. Um, now I'm adding sort of I, I'm wanting to add this like third idea into this metaphor, which is the, the idea of the blueprint. And the blueprint is a bit like a map, but it's different in that uh, you use a blueprint to uh, create a new bit of the territory. Like, we use a blueprint to, like, create a plane or to, like, build a house or something. Like, that's how blueprints are used. They have similar properties like maps. Like, they're also, like, not as detailed and, and stuff like that. Um, but the, the sort of error is kind of inversed where we go from territory to map. Sorry. Yeah, where we go, like, we're sort of trying to build a map out of the territory. We're trying to build a bit of territory out of the blueprint. Um, and obviously, like, maps and blueprints inform each other, right? Like, we're able to build better blueprints if you have better maps. Uh, like, before we had, like, a bunch of, bunch of maps around, like, how, like, mechanics and, like, uh, uh, aerodynamics and stuff, we weren't able to have good blueprints of planes. Um, and then the, bringing this sort of back to this idea here is that the space of intelligence system here is like a very abstract notion. This is like probably best understood as like all the intelligence systems that could, could there could be theoretically, even if they like don't currently exist. Um, now, if we build blue, if we build new blueprints, we'll become able to instantiate new bits of these like possible intelligence systems. Um, and then there's this like very subtle relationship between how we currently do map making and also like what systems will actually come about. Uh, so like you can imagine an entire like research community being like very bullish on the way AGI is going to be built is via like this sort of theory. So like all the blueprints that people work on creating sort of use, use this theory or use these bits of like maps that we have. And this will actually shape what sort of systems we'll build. And maybe, and this is like, a, an open question, but it's at least conceivable that um, you could imagine an alternative history where people were bu very bullish about this this other theory instead, and like all the blueprints that were being created were sort of like mostly drawing on this other theory, and you might end up having a future where you end up with different systems because like we are in the end still the people who are creating the systems. Um, so this is like this sort of intricate relationship between map making and blueprint making. Um, that sort of folds on into each other, onto each other. But that, yeah, that's pretty abstract. But I think this is like interesting and relevant. Fair. Um, I would encourage everybody to upvote the questions that are being answered. So have some gauge of which ones are popular. Uh, but in the meantime, um, if you had to bet, which proxies for AGI would you think were the more plausible ones? I mean. I think in, in the spirit of my talk, I kind of a little bit want to reject the, uh, the premise. I do, like I can say some things. Um, um, I don't know. I think we should be worried about ML-based uh, artificial intelligence. It is definitely affecting what the world looks like currently a whole lot. So like understanding these systems closely is very important. Um, the, the problem here is also a bit that like AGI is underspecified or like I, I, I'm, I'm mostly sort of dislike using the term AGI because like it's uh, philosophically kind of problematic uh, what exactly we mean by this. Um, I do like, I think one sort of like more like frontier thing that I'm like a bit interested in is how powerful like active inference or predictive processing will be as like um, a theory predicting what these sort of systems will look like. Um, uh, and yeah, like there's some work now sort of getting started that is like trying to do machine learning very much informed by these, these, um, these theories and like we'll, we'll see whether they just become much more capable or not. Um, and then I think there's sort of a third way here in which I think it is correct to uh, not like, I think some amount of thinking about AGI is like a sing like this single system that it's going to be created and will have these like very general, very powerful capacities and like what's up with that. But I think there's like also a lot of need to think about if we have various powerful AI applications, how are they going to be embedded in in how we live together, how we do it, 
do like um, research and technolo technological progress and economics. So like um, this is more of a sort of multi-agent uh, type of scenario. Um, and then the like transformativeness here doesn't come from this like necessarily single system who has like full generality and more like us collectively achieving full generality and that being really problematic. And I think we need to think about that too. Yeah, that's my Great. Um, what practical actions would you recommend governments take to effectively prevent AI misalignments, especially considering geopolitical consequences? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is like, <laughs> these are like super hard questions and I'm like mostly, like, I, I don't know. I think I'm mostly, I like not, I mostly don't really want to give a, like a one minute like take on this because this just doesn't seem useful. Like I will say something for a minute and then it might be interpreted in many ways. Um, mostly unclear, um, think about it yourself. I think that um, one thing that seems I am in favor of is like just actually trying to slow down progress. Um, and I think uh, generally pushing also sort of in the public discourse to like push towards A, the, these um, uh, for, like enterprises that are like particularly strong in like pushing AI progress to like be really responsible with um, how they think about safety and like the more sort of public discourse there is about that, the more pressure there is uh, in those systems and incentives for those systems to, to, for those groups to take this seriously. And then secondly, slowing down at the moment just seems like pretty great for like both technical and governance reasons. Like these things seem robust. Um, there's some questions currently around, can we get much better at evaluating how dangerous specific applications are? Um, and if you could do so, we could a bit more differentially like increase our like safety precautions or our like uh, m political measures for systems that are like dangerous. Um, so like that seems like worthwhile thinking more about, but I think we're also like by far not there yet and knowing how to, how to actually evaluate the thing we care about. Um, and there's like risks here around safety washing or something. Um, yeah, that's my take. Okay. Um, regarding proxies, uh, how useful would you take it to say that AGI can constitute alien intelligences, i.e. very unknown, not little green men? I think there's value in that, especially in like depriming us from thinking about it in terms that are just very familiar to us because of the sort of like scales we live at and perceive at. And I think it's like really, really hard to like underestimate how much our priors are shaped by this. Um, like there is some chance that the, like those priors might be justified. Like it is plausible um, that the future AI in intelligence systems we build do in fact look a bunch like human intelligence or something because there's maybe these like strongly convergent features about what it means to be intelligent. But I think as these like very bounded reasoners in this very complex world, um, we should be very careful to like not just like jump to this conclusion. Um, I think there's an interesting analogy here to um, astrobiology, for example, which so this is basically like, among others, the question of like, what might life look like? What shapes might life take on different planets? And this like, there's a sentence which is like moved of like on different planets is a bit of a like cognitive, like mental, philosophical like tool to, to like help us deprime ourselves from like uh, the fact that like, we as like, you know, statistical machines ourselves have been trained on like the sort of things we see every day. Um, and like, it's like very easy to underestimate uh, how, how off this might be. So I think it's very valuable, at least as, as, a, as a means of depriming or like flagging how primed we might be. And then beyond that, it doesn't contain much information, right? Like it could be an alien intelligence, right? That, that's cool, but it doesn't say much substantive yet beyond depriming. Very fair. Um, how would this pluralistic account um, manage the fact that proxies don't seem to account for self-improvement within AIs? Um, or do you think the proxies can accommodate self-improvement? So I think there are some uh, some samples of like self-improvement that we do see. Uh, you could say that sort of like the economy is pretty self, like us and the economy like uh, is very self-improvement improving. Like we have gone through several like uh, uh, revolutions where like we've like massively changed the rate of production itself. Um, and I think this is just clearly an example of self-improvement. Um, 
there's also important disanalogies, of course. Um, like, for example, the time scale at which self-improvement here can happen, just like, because it's like, it could possibly be so, like, so much faster, it's like, it's sort of a different type, it becomes a different type of beast. Um, there's also like, something about how much, like, in the discourse we often refer to this as like, accessing your own source code. Um, basically, this captures something about how directly can you change yourself? Like, I, uh, humans in general, don't start to like, directly mess with how their brains are wired. And, like, uh, we, we can like, you know, try to build habits or something, or like, get new catches or something. Um, and that does in fact shape our brains a little bit, but it's like quite, um, it's quite slow timescales um, and quite indirect. And if you imagine you have an AGI that like runs on some codes and it could sort of directly access its code very cheaply, that again might sort of just be a step function up of like how fast and uh, self-improvement can happen and like how drastic the effects of it might be. So I think in general, if like these proxies, there's always an inter like a dual sort of question which is interesting, which is like, where are the analogies and then where are the disanalogies? So like, where do the analogies break? And I think both, both questions are actually pretty constructive or insightful or like fruitful a lot of the time. Can we expect um, content and function of AGI to be subject to evolutionary pressures um, via specific types of human use? Can you just repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, I think it's, should we expect artificial intelligence to be subject to evolutionary selection pressures in a sort of artificial selection, but particularly through specific uses of humans? Um, yeah, somewhat. I mean, there's like evolutionary pressures happening at various levels. Like, you can think about ML training to in part be uh, subject to evolutionary pressures. That's sort of like one containment. Then there is... I, like you can make some argument about like again like differentially what sort of like capabilities are we as humans interested to automate automate um, that again th I think this is like not super properly understood as like evolution exactly but there's some selection going on um, and then there is some maybe third interesting dimension here around cultural evolution which I think is like relevant in this like language model context a bunch which is that. Um, there's like pretty weird uh, feedback loops that we should probably expect around, like language models are trained on text in the first place. Um, there's also like some, some research suggesting that we're pretty soon gonna run out of data for this. Uh, I think a report by Epoch says by 2026, we're basically gonna run out, uh, assuming that we're gonna continue like scaling our models and like those bigger models need more data to train on, et cetera. Um, so, they're currently being sort of trained on the sort of data that civilization has been producing so far. Now we're entering an era where uh, increasingly large parts of the data that we produce is actually produced by AI systems. And so what we get for like future generations of uh, trained language models is they're gonna be trained on text or data that AI systems created. Um, and there's like interesting questions about what feedback loops that might uh, Im imply. Um, yeah, and this like is sort of accelerated also by the, f the fact that once you have a trained model, so what I said so far is about training those models, and then once you have a trained model and you deploy, deploy it uh, sort of into the world, um, and for example, it has access to the internet, it can search. Um, and like you've probably heard that these, train these models, um, their behavior is quite shaped by how you prompt them. Um, so now, you, like, if they also can access the internet, um, they will be, in some sense, their behavior will be prompted on what they found on the internet. In part, they might find things on the internet that they themselves wrote, or they might uh, find sort of like self-reaffirming um, narratives about, well, you know, being Sydney is so-and-so, being Sydney is like really nasty. Now it's gonna like look up, if, if you ask it, oh, go look, like if you ask Sing Bignay, being Sydney to like look up itself and it like learns that it's very nasty, it's gonna like reenact being very nasty or something like that. So there's like pretty weird feedback loops going on um, that are very understudied. Biological intelligences have one underlying universal goal, propagation of their own DNA code. How much do you think this makes them bad proxies for future AGIs? <laughs> um, complicated. Um, I, I mean, I think it's at least to some extent debatable how exactly we should understand what this the final goal of biological systems. Uh, 
Darwinian evolutionary theory does very much suggest that like the thing sort of driving the, this like emergent behavior over evolutionary timescales is um, uh, replication uh, or replication or like um, yeah uh, and but and I think this is really important and quite real. Um, and on the other hand, there's like other theories uh, that actually suggest different things driving, for example, behavior at the level of agents. Like active inference makes different assumptions. Like active inference is mostly like wanting to uh, continue your sort of like bound, like you want to have your boundary, your agent boundary not be, be changed uh, and like maintain that against entropy. Like that's sort of like one of the principles of like how you imagine an active inference agent to wanting to continue and what drives its behavior. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, I, I'd sort of like relativize a little bit how much it is just like straightforwardly true that this is like the case in biological systems. And then, um, I don't know, I think it opens up a big, uh, big range of questions we could ask about what is then the main driver in AI systems. Um, and that will depend on their training environment and stuff like that. Okay. I'm going to make this the last question. Um, Given that space of possible intelligence is potentially very large, what aspect of human intelligence, e.g. reasoning, value, social learning, is most likely to be similar or generalizable to AGI? Yeah, good question. Um, so this has a lot to do with like questions around convergence or something, or like selection theorems, like which sort of uh, cognitive faculties have the, the shape that they're like, they seem to be very useful across just a range of environments such that we would expect them to come up a lot. Um, one I've been recently thinking about a bunch is um, like planning. Uh, I'm like air quoting this because like, w w there's one way of interpreting planning which is quite like um, uh, sort of mentalistic and like this is how we do planning and I like mean a somewhat broader notion but there's a sense in which like, um, when you're the sort of agent who can imagine its future, uh, its possible future scenarios, uh, has a sense for like what, where it wants to go, and then sort of like imagine different paths it could take, and then like evaluate them, and then like steer towards them. That's highly adaptive across uh, across different environments and tasks it might and, and encounter. And I think roughly this like amounts to planning or something like global consequentialist like reasoning. Um, you want a thing and you like figure out how to best get the thing. So that seems something that is like um, plausibly very convergent. Um, I think that's the main one I would want to highlight. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Cool.